Yes, I can start now. Okay, sir. So, hello, good evening, everyone. I am Shu Singh, research scholar from School of Forensic Science and Risk Management, Rashtriya Raksha University. Welcome you all to the seventh session of the first dialogue webinar series. And I'm pleased to inform you all that our first dialogue forum turns a year old today. Last year, on the same day, this think tank of knowledge came into existence. So now, avoiding much delay and beginning with the proceedings, I now invite Sudhanshu sir to take over the session. Over to you, sir. सर वीडियोस में आवाज नहीं आ रही Thank <laughs> you. 
good evening everybody good evening ma'am i'm uh, privileged to introduce you uh, tiffany roy is a forensic dna expert with over 13 years of forensic biology experience in both pr- public and private laboratories in united states she has processed thousands of dna samples and thousands of cases over the course of her career she has provided expert witness testimony in more than 100 cases in state federal and international courts She instructs undergraduates at Palm Beach Atlantic University, University of Maryland Global Campus, and Southern New Hampshire University. She currently acts as a consultant for at- attorneys and the media in the area of forensic biology through her firm, Forensic Aid LLC. Ma'am holds a degree from Sy- Syracuse University, Massachusetts School of Law, and University of Florida in the areas of biology, law, and forensic science. her teaching legal writing and testimonial experience has helped her to take complex scientific concepts and make them easily understandable for the non scientist she has assisted dr safestein in completing forensic science from the crime scene to crime lab uh, pearson to 2019 and, and has authored the text the complete guide to the american board of criminalistics molecular biology examination to assist working science, forensic scientists achieve the goal of certification ma'am is a member of american academy of forensic sciences the northeastern association of forensic scientists and the massachusetts board of bar examiners she is a certified diplomat in the area of forensic biology by the american board of criminalistics aside from her teaching writing and consulting ma'am also assists with international capacity building initiatives providing subject matter expertise for trainings for criminal justice stakeholders in the middle east and africa pleased to have you ma'am uh, i welcome you on the behalf of first dialogue forum and the sfsrm team uh, over to you the floor is yours i'd like to thank everyone for inviting me especially especially dr chaudhry um i just want to make sure everyone can see my presentation can you all see it clearly i'm trying to okay So this talk is going to be about the recent advancements in forensic DNA analysis and there are two main areas where this is going to focus um one is on mixed DNA profiles and assigning a weight to those profiles and also breaking them into their respective contributor parts and then one is going to be focused on forensic genetic genealogy because those are the two most prevalent advancements in forensic DNA um in the last decade i would say dna testing in general has gotten more sensitive over time and we're able to develop dna profiles from just a few skin cells uh whereas 10 years ago we really needed a body fluid from blood semen or saliva in order to develop a dna profile so we're seeing a lot of complex mixtures of dna from more than one person often 3 4 and 5 individuals and sometimes more and this has presented some serious challenges for forensic dna analysts around the country here in the united states and across the globe um mixed dna profile interpretation has gotten more complicated and more difficult to perform in a objective and standardized way and um so i have a link here in this talk for a a short youtube video that describes this in more detail by dr dan crane and he has a way of making it very plain the differences between full single source dna profile interpretation and mixed dna profile interpretation when we have partial profiles and more complex mixtures so The reason I'm covering this is because in the states we have rules and laws that require us to give a weight to a DNA profile to to describe to the jury or the judge how strong the evidence is and how strong the association would be to anyone we would include in that DNA profile. And not all DNA profiles are the same. We can have DNA profiles that are single source that are very clear. to interpret um where it matches 100% and we can have DNA profiles that are mixtures where someone is included 
um, and the inclusion is not very strong and it's not very clear whether they, they could be having some of their information missing or dropping out. And the reason that we have rules and laws that govern the association of the statistical weight are to give the judge or the jury some idea of how strong or weak the DNA profile evidence is. So um, we really take a lot of great pains and we have in the past in interpreting DNA profiles and trying to be conservative um, for a, a defendant, anyone that we were comparing to. Um, and so when we're looking at a DNA profile, we're really trying to break it down into its component parts when we see a mixture. We really want to know the, the genotypes of the individuals who are contributing, what ratios they may be contributing, what the relative peak heights of those peaks would be that are associated with each contributor. And that's very difficult to ascertain just from a human perspective because there's a lot of information we don't know. There's a lot of information that might be missing. Um, there are sometimes artifacts that are introduced through contamination or just byproduct of the amplification process. And those things can complicate our ability to break the DNA profile down into its component parts and make confident comparisons for inclusion or exclusion. And it's very difficult without knowing some information about the DNA profile, um, what associations to make and if, if a human person should make those. And so as a field, we're sort of moving away from interpreting profiles that are less informative um, in a human way. And we're moving more toward an algorithmic and computer software based analysis of those DNA profiles. So sometimes we have a great deal of information when we have a, a very clear major profile or we have a single source DNA profile that we've obtained. And then sometimes we have low level mixed DNA profiles that don't give us a whole lot of information. And really in those scenarios, we need to have um, some method to assist the analyst when we're making those comparisons and we're assigning a statistical weight to those matches and inclusions. Um, so as I, as I noted in the US, there must be some quantitative estimate of weight that's given anytime we associate a person with a piece of evidence. And the traditional ways that we used to do this were the random match probability, which was the chance of a randomly selected unrelated person matching the DNA evidence it's reserved mostly for um, single source major profiles or single source profiles. Uh, mixed evidence was generally calculated using the combined probability of inclusion using the product rule. And it was also the chance that a randomly selected unrelated person would be included in the mixture, but it gave no attention to um, specific genotype combinations and it was really a blunt tool that had to take into account any possible contributor combination that might be randomly included. We've moved away from product rule um, probabilities to the likelihood ratio. And the likelihood ratio is really just the ratio of two probabilities. It's the likelihood of the evidence given to competing propositions. And so um, across Europe and Australia, New Zealand, they've been using the likelihood ratio for some time. And with the advent of probabilistic genotyping, which is the computer software I'm gonna to describe to you now that we use for our interpretation that employs the likelihood ratio. So with random match probabilities, there were always limitations um, and necessary assumptions that had to be made. As I noted before, the random match probability is typically applied when we have a single source profile or a clear major profile. Um, and this allows us to pair genotypes with this type of calculation. Um, so if we can tell which peaks, which genotypes are paired, then we can apply the random match probabilities to those. And it's usually more, it's clear cut um, which peaks should be attributed together to, to the same contributor. With combined probability of inclusion or exclusion, um, we have to assume that any people that would be included in the mixture of DNA would not be related. So it assumes the individuals in the mixture are unrelated to the person of interest. And um, 
you have to have complete DNA data. And if you're missing information, as we often are now with low level mixed profiles, then you really can't apply this calculation because you'd never know what you're missing. And in essence, you're really not encompassing the entire segment of the population that may be randomly included. And therefore you could be overweighting your evidence. It also has to assume that all contributors are from the same ethnic background. So there were some significant limitations to the calculation. One benefit of combined probabilities is that in the United States, we became comfortable explaining those to judges and juries and judges and juries became comfortable understanding that information. Um, they're having difficulty now. Forensic DNA analysts are having difficulty describing the likelihood ratio accurately and relaying the information um, in a technically accurate way in front of judges and juries in a way that they can understand it. So there have been a great deal. There's a large body of cognitive science research that shows that there's some misunderstanding about the likelihood ratio, and it's more difficult for analysts to explain and for the consumers of this information, the judges and juries, to, to understand. So the likelihood ratio has some limitations also. Um, the relatedness issue is also something that has to be addressed mathematically. So a traditional binary likelihood ratio calculation assumes individuals in the mixture are unrelated to each other and to the person being compared. And it requires additional calculations if we expect there to be related individuals involved in the mixture. Um, it also requires a completeness of data, and if any of the data is missing, the calculation would not apply. Um, and it has the same assumptions as the combined probability as to ethnicity. Ways that we can overcome these limitations now are through the use of probabilistic genotyping. So probabilistic genotyping is, so these are software programs that are developed to deconvolute to break down the DNA profile into its genotype components or likely genotype components using algorithms and modeling. And so the model will break the DNA profile down into its likely component parts and will assign a likelihood ratio if it makes a comparison and finds that someone is included in the mixture. So in a lot of ways, this has standardized mixture interpretation um, for laboratories who are employing this method. Before, it was based on an analyst's training and experience and skill level to be able to break the DNA profiles down into their genotype components of a mixture. Um, they were often limited by the laboratory's validations and technology, as well as their procedures and protocols. But employing the computer software allows laboratories across the country in different laboratories to be more consistent because it's objectively being analyzed. So the mathematics don't change from laboratory to laboratory in a, in a significant way. And so it's, it's shown more consistency within the lab and, and across laboratories in the United States. One of the ways this overcomes some of the limitations of prior calculation methods is that it can make adjustments mathematically for uncertain data. So if there's information that's very low level and it could be dropping out, the computer program can make adjustments for allelic dropout and the probability that the allelic dropout might be occurring given the peak heights noted in the DNA profile that it's seeing. It uses a mathematical calculation called Markov Chain Monte Carlo in its analyses. And this is like a sophisticated game of hot and cold, where it's sort of making guesses as to what the most likely genotype combinations would be for each contributor. Um, it was developed by the Environmental Science and Research Foundation in New Zealand, and it's distributed in the United States by Niche Vision. So this probabilistic genotyping software, the StarMix program, and I don't endorse any single program, but this is the most popular one in the US. Um, this is the one that most government crime labs are using here now. Um, it's the one I'm most familiar with. And there are reasons for that and I'll explain why, but I'm not endorsing any single program over any of the other programs. I'm just introducing you to the concept of the probabilistic genotyping software and talking about the three most common software programs. So um, the next software, probabilistic genotyping software program that I'm going to describe is TrueAllele. Um, so the first one was StarMix. 
That's the New Zealand program. It was developed by John Buckleton and people at ESR. And True Allele was developed by a company called Cyber Genetics. And the primary developer there was Dr. Mark Perlin. Um, it applies the likelihood ratio as well. And it uses computer algorithms to deconvolute mixtures and make adjustments for uncertain data. Although this is a private company, it's not a government entity. Um, and environmental ESR, environmental science and research in New Zealand is basically their government lab. And so the government scientists developed that original program. Um, this is a private company and this is a private private person who developed the software program for distribution. And he's very protective of it. Um, there have been a lot of legal battles here in the United States for people who want to inspect the source codes of these programs. Um, and he's very protective about his source code and his intellectual property. So there isn't as much training material and information available about the True Allele program and how it works. Um, and that's why I have a better understanding of the StarMix program because they are a little bit more forthcoming and willing to share proprietary information with the legal system. So True Allele is another program that operates similarly, um, but it's, it's the province of a private company. And then the third one I'm going to describe is called Euroformix. And this is what I would say is the most popular program in Europe. Um, and it applies the likelihood ratio. It uses computer algorithms to deconvolute the mixtures and makes adjustments for uncertain data, but it doesn't use the Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Um, it's described as a gamma model, which uses the maximum likelihood estimate. And so the mathematics are just a little bit different. Um, and so you can expect if, if you were testing a sample with one program like StarMix, and also testing it with uh, another program like Euroformix, you might get different results. And I know there are studies being performed now to see how different those results would be. And I'm hoping to see some information published on that, where those differences are um, and what causes them. This was developed by um, the European Union. It was developed by, on a government grant. Um, I think one of the primary people involved with its development was Dr. Peter Gill and it's open source software. So, in contrast with the last two programs that we've talked about, this software is open source and completely free. And they recommend that you have training um, on the use of the program if you want to employ it in your casework. Um, but the other programs are significantly, ex you know, they're pretty expensive to employ in your lab. Um, and it costs money for a license. And so this is a benefit of Euroformix that um, helps it, I think, in some of the European markets, it's easier to implement in laboratory casework when you don't have to overcome a huge cost for, for bringing it into your laboratory. So this is important in the United States because not all DNA profiles are the same. We know that we get some DNA profiles that are nondescript, that are mixed, that don't tell us a whole lot about the person that might be contributing or people that might be contributing. And there could be a lot of overlapping information where the chances of a random inclusion would be high and they might include a significant portion of the alleles that would be distributed throughout the population. And so how do we differentiate those DNA profiles from really strong single source DNA profiles that may be linked back to a single person? Um, and we do that through statistics. So we weight the inclusion and in courts across the country here, if we're not able to attach a weight to the evidence, the chance that there might be a misunderstanding by a judge or a jury is considered high. And we wouldn't ever want anyone to interpret a weak DNA profile with poor data as a strong DNA profile with clear data, like a single source sample. And so we always attach these statistics in line with the ISFG recommendations and um, SWGDAM, which is the Scientific Working Group for DNA Analysis Methods here in the United States. Um, they require that as well as the National Accreditation Board. So a benefit to probabilistic genotyping is it, it helps laboratories achieve a more objective analysis. There isn't as much subjective analyst discretion. 
the analyst is still required to make a lot of interpretations about um, noise peaks or um, byproducts that are not true allele peaks um, and other things like the number of contributors to a DNA profile. It still requires analyst input and the analyst still has to look at the DNA profile and make assessments to determine whether the software output makes logical sense, intuitive sense to the analyst. And in order to ensure the output is correct, if the analyst can't do that, then they shouldn't be applying the program. But this helps to sta it's standardization um, of DNA profile interpretation across labs and within labs across the United States. So this has been an important advancement here in the United States. Um, as far as standardizing DNA mixture interpretation. In the second part of this talk, I wanna talk about forensic genetic genealogy, um, which has become very popular here in the United States in the last two, I would say one or two years. Um, there have been some very large cases that have been solved using databases from private genetic testing companies I'm going to use Ancestry.com as an example, even though they don't allow searching on their um, on their website, on their database. But there are some databases that are like that, that do allow law enforcement searching. So um, I'll talk about some of the more important cases where that's been used and sort of what the methodology of genealogy searching is and how it's being applied in a law enforcement capacity. So traditional DNA testing, as you all know, we use short tandem repeat testing. That's the standard here in the United States. We're looking at segments of DNA and the codes are about four or five base pairs long and they can repeat a variable number of times. Segments are usually hundreds of base pairs long and we haven't linked any of the STRs that we use forensically to anything that's coding um, it's not helpful for us in diagnosis of um, genetic disease or physical traits. Um, so we don't get health information or ancestry information from our forensic testing we're performing now. In, in forensic genealogy, they're looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And this is different than, than STR testing, short tandem repeat. Um, this is actual um, sequencing really is what it is. Uh, one of the common ways that this is performed is with chip technology, a major company here in the United States that's performing this kind of testing is called Parabon Nano Labs, And they use the Illumina Infinium, Infinium Cytosnip 850K bead chip. Um, they need for this testing a greater quantity of DNA then we need for current STR testing. As I said before, STR testing has gotten very sensitive and they need high quality, high quantity DNA to use the SNP chip testing. Um, and call rates can be low if there's degradation in the samples. Um, it contains approximately 850,000 empirically selected SNPs and it spans the entire genome with enriched coverage for about 3,000 genes. So it is looking at gene information as opposed to our forensic testing. Um, another kind of testing that's used for genealogy is whole genome sequencing. And so in this testing, it's just like it sounds, the whole genome is sequenced. Um, there's a lot of information that they don't use for the genealogy purposes, but um, you can imagine why this would be sensitive data. Basically your entire blueprint um, all of your genetic information, all of your phenotypic information is being transcribed. And so this can be labor intensive because it requires a bioinformaticist to go through and pick out the information that's going to be uploaded to these databases for comparison. So um, there are labs here that do whole genome sequencing. One is Othram, it's in Texas. There's another lab called Hudson Alpha. This type of testing, whole genome sequencing, is preferable because you need less DNA input um, and it's better for degraded samples. So you have a higher chance of success, but it does generate a lot more information. It's a lot more, I think, informationally invasive. Um, phenotyping is something 
phenotype information is being derived from the kinds of testing that I've just described. And so phenotype information is linked to skin color, eye color, hair color. Um, the shape of a person's face and nose and freckles have been included in some of these results, although there's not much scientific support in the research to say that those estimations are, are accurate. So the ones that are supported by a solid scientific foundation of research are hair color, eye color, and skin color. Um, but all of the other ones about face shape and freckles and the shape of a person's nose, there's just not enough research on that to say with any level of scientific certainty whether that information they're giving you is accurate. And there's a foremost expert in the United States who does this kind of research who, who will do this kind of phenotyping testing for free. And she works at Indiana University at Purdue University. Her name is Dr. Susan Walsh. So a couple of things that have come up um, in the United States when we're using this genotyping, um, genetic genealogy information, it is revealing important information about the individuals that are, that are coming across this search and the individuals who are being searched in the databases. So it, it will tell us information about hair color, about relatives, it can give you health information, it can give us um, ancestry information. And so um, there are some privacy issues that are being discussed and described here in the United States. One of the issues is um, that we have a government database here, and I think you have a government database also in India. Um, our government database is called the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS. It's controlled by the government, and there are laws in place that govern its use. It contains DNA profiles from individuals who have broken the law and people who have been convicted of crimes. And so their privacy rights are not as strong as private individuals. Um, and their participation in the database is mandatory. They don't have a choice whether or not they would like to participate once you break a crime and you'll be included in the database here in, in the United States in general. These genealogy databases like um, 23andMe these are private citizens that have uploaded their DNA or had their DNA tested by companies like 23andMe to do familial research or to research, you know, health and um, and their, you know, their background um, information. And it's private data. It's privately controlled by a company, for-profit company. Um, one of the biggest databases that's used now is called the GEDmatch database. It's controlled by a company called Verigen, and um, they have control over the consumer data now. They purchased it at some, some point last year, I want to say. Um, there are zero laws or regulations that govern the searching of genealogy databases of private citizens. There are some interim guidelines that guide these types of investigations, but there is very little in the way of case law. Um, we have no idea how this is going to impact constitutional rights of individuals, private citizens who have full privacy rights. Um, and so may, they may not have been aware at the time of these searches that their DNA was going to be used in this way. Um, participation in these databases, the genealogy databases, is voluntary. These people voluntarily do this, but not necessarily for the law enforcement purpose. And so at any time, the consumer can opt out and remove their data. And these are all considerations that law enforcement is considering now here in the United States while these, these kinds of investigations are taking place. There are a few databases that I'm going to name for you um, just so that you'd be familiar with them. The, the two primary databases where genealogy searching is taking place, they're called GEDmatch, which is owned by Verigen, and then there's Family Tree DNA. Um, and that was owned by Family Tree DNA, and I heard there was a recent sale of that company, so I would have to look more into that. But um, th some of the other databases that are not necessarily accept, uh, accessible to law enforcement are 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, um, and MyHeritage. So there are some databases that still exist. Um, I would say that law enforcement still makes attempts to search those databases through legal process, through search warrants and um, court order. 
but the ones that are opted in databases, which are accessible to law enforcement in which they let the participants know that law enforcement might be searching our GEDmatch and family tree DNA. So one of the more famous cases that involved uh, the genealogy searches, the one that made that technology really come to the forefront was the Golden State Killer case. And it, this case is an old case. He um, you know, was hunting in the 70s, 1970s and 1980s, and he raped and killed many people in the state of California. And he remained um, unknown to law enforcement until not, I think it was the year before, not 2019, they identified him. A forensic genealogist from California named Barbara Ray Ventner identified him using some of the databases that we've just described and the searching that we just described and was able to track him back through the DNA of his ancestors and identify him. And so that is another major advancement um, and, and trend in forensic DNA. There are, you know, there's traditional DNA testing, which the genealogy really is being used as a, an investigative lead in order for law enforcement to go out and collect a sample to then bring back to the lab and perform traditional STR testing eventually. <coughs> and it's that traditional STR testing that is being used in court and that's being performed in the crime labs. But the genealogy testing, the searching through the databases and the identification of relatives and the um, the DNA, collecting DNA from relatives to trace back through the family trees, um, that's a different type of, of testing, more, more invasive testing um, and more informational testing. Um, and then it involves searching these databases of private citizens. But it's been able to solve a great number of cold case crimes and identify the unidentified previously unidentified remains of many many people hundreds of people and so it has great potential but we still don't know how the law is going to handle that and so between that and and probabilistic genotyping those are the two biggest trends um, emerging trends in forensic dna so now i would like to turn it over to the group and ask if anyone has any questions for me Hello. Hello. Good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Nice for your presentation. I just want to have a few clarifications from you. Okay. First, I may identify myself. I am Dr. J.R. God, a biologist, serologist, and then turned DNA scientist and scene of crime investigator. Nice to meet you, Dr. Gar. I am director of School of uh, Forensic Science and Risk Management at this Rashtriya Shakti University now. Thank and you for attending my talk. I am very thankful to you for very kindly delivering this uh, enlightening talk. But do, I was listening to you, but I have a few clarifications from you, not questions, in fact. Okay. First of all, is DNA evidence treated as corroborative evidence or decisive evidence in the courts of law in U.S.? So, it's mostly what we would consider circumstantial. We consider it circumstantial evidence. So it doesn't. It's not direct evidence of a crime, but mm -hmm. it does. It can place someone in the, the vicinity of the crime scene. So it's something that's considered, but it's not direct evidence. You mean to say it is sporting evidence? Yes. Okay. My second clarification is, how do you maintain the chain of custody? And how much American courts are concerned with it? American courts are very concerned with the chain of custody. And that can be the difference between using the evidence in court and not having it allowed in court. Um, in the U.S., we maintain the chain of custody mostly with computers now. So we have laboratory information systems or LIMS systems, and the evidence is digitally tracked with barcodes. 
um, as it moves throughout the laboratory. Thank you. Then there is what is the percentage of inconclusive results in different cases you examined? So it would depend now on the type of testing. Um, so we talked about two methods of interpretation and the manual method where a DNA analyst has to try to look at the data and determine if comparisons should be made to the data. Using that method, there is a lot more, there's a lot more inconclusive results. Um, now with the, with the assistance of the computers, there are fewer inconclusive results. So the computer is, is assisting analysts here in the United States to be able to make interpretations on some of that data that would be previously inconclusive. Could these be two to 5% of the cases? Um, it, the inconclusive results? Using, yes, the yes. Old, using the old manual method where a human person is doing that, I, yes, I think 35% or even more could be inconclusive now with um, the samples that we see often here. Okay. Then in inter-laboratory proficiency testing, uh, what is the percentage of, you can say, incorrect results? Those things or, aren't necessarily... I wouldn't know about interlaboratory what the percentage of, of incorrect results are because I don't think laboratories necessarily share no. that. Um, yeah. We... I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. All over, all over the world, people are practicing inter-laboratory proficiency testing. Suppose one sample from my laboratory is sent to your laboratory without disclosing any details for that. That sample has been examined in my laboratory as well as in your laboratory. And then the sample is also sent to a third laboratory or a fourth laboratory. So just to check up whether the testing is being, being done appropriately or otherwise. Just a sort of auditing, you can say. So during these audits or during these checkings, are there some erroneous results or otherwise? Yes, there are. So there, there have been two large scale studies here, interlaboratory studies in the States, and they were performed by NIST. NIST stands for the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And these studies, the most recent ones were performed in 2005 and 2013. So they call them MIX-05 and MIX-13. And um, in, those, in those studies, which have been published, and you can, you can check, you can look them up online, but it showed that there was a lot of variation between laboratories and also a lot of mistakes were being made. And so those studies really were the impetus for scientists here in the United States to turn to these objective computer analyses to try to standardize things because it showed really the imperfection of, of the analyses between laboratories and also within the laboratory. So um, they really, they used different, five different profiles of differing complexity. And they found that some, you know, the ones that they made harder to interpret, the more complex profiles, there were more mistakes. Um, but the simpler profiles, there were fewer mistakes. But I would urge you to um, to look up that study. I think the first author on that study was Dr. Michael Koble, and it, it's called Mix05 and Mix13. Thank you, madam. Thank you. I won't take your much time. Again, I congratulate you for being with all of us and for enlightening our students, our all faculty members, and even myself, I would say. Thank you very much. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for such an amazing lecture. Thank you for discussing with us the various advancements that take place in the forensic DNA technology. So before going to the Q&A part, I request all the participants to please switch on their cameras so that we can have a snap of the session. Please. <laughs>
thank you everyone so now coming to the question and answers part participants you can unmute yourself and ask the questions or you can even type it down in the chat section we'll be taking it one by one uh hello ma'am uh, thank you for the session i am dr shweta from uh, school of forensic science and risk management rashtriya raksha university uh i i wanted to know about the databases related to forensic genealogy and uh, what are the ways of accessing it because uh, we were trying to have a small study on the comparison of certain databases but uh, you could not find out the ways of accessing them so if you could suggest any specific databases existing and how uh, they can be accessed if at all needed so i would say the the two that i mentioned that you need to google gedmatch and it's a for profit database where i think you you sign up um you have to create a user name and access um i think there might be there are some classes that you can take on how to navigate the gedmatch database and what kind of you know where to upload your data what kinds of analyses the the, the database is going to make when you make your comparisons but um so it, it just google gedmatch and i think it will come up and then the other one is family tree dna um so you could just google that and i i've never actually used that because i think you have to pay to access family tree dna and i've never i've never paid the fee but basically you just sign up you create a username and a login um and then if you have the the correct files that you need to upload um you can just upload them to the database and perform your comparisons with the information that's in the database so if you have dna profiles from crime scenes that you have snip tested um or you have the correct files from whole genome sequencing then you can upload them there um and i think they also have customer service representatives that will be able to help you and work with you to help you figure out how to do that so it's gedmatch and family tree dna thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much any further questions you can please ask it so with this we come to the end of the q and a part i now invite prachi kathane assistant professor school of forensic science and risk management to give the vote of thanks uh good evening everyone uh, good morning ma'am uh, ma'am before uh, starting this uh, there is one question i would like to take up uh, uh, it's in chat box any free online course on forensic dna offered by any university in usa any related course through f E M A D H S funded. Uh, I'm not sure if there there used to be some free ones that were that were available through the National Institute of Justice, um, but I think they now are offered for a small fee. Um, one of the places I would look for for that is um, oh gosh, what is the name of that? It's National Center for Forensic Sciences. It's in Tampa, Florida. Hold on. For <laughs> NFSTC is the acronym. Um and NFSTC is a is a subsidiary of Florida International University and they do a great deal of online training for DNA analysts. and i think that it's available for for a small fee not as much as it would cost to take a regular college course but um it's available for i think uh, maybe 100 or 150 us dollars so that's the only resource i can think of okay thank you ma'am uh first of all i congratulate everyone uh, who is associated with first dialogue for successfully completing one year fingers crossed uh, for many such more years uh, today on this occasion we had a wonderful session by uh, ms tiffany roy ma'am 
uh, forensic DNA expert. Ma'am, it's indeed a privilege to have you today with us. I, Prachi Kathane, Assistant Professor at School of Forensic Science and Risk Management, Rashtriya Raksha University, on the behalf of entire team of First Dialogue, SFSRM and RRU would like to thank you for this wonderful enlightening session. Ma'am, you covered all the real-time challenges failed, uh, faced uh, in this uh, a new forensic DNA technology. I'm sure the audience would have gained better understanding of the subject. I extend my heartful thanks to our director, Professor Dr. J.R. Gorsar, for his persistent encouragement and support. I'm thankful to Dr. Sumit Kumar Chaudhary, sir, Chairperson First Dialogue for bringing this idea to establish such platform where the eminent speakers from the world can be called upon and share their valuable experiences and knowledge. A big thank you to Sudanshu Sekar Tiwari sir, convener of this forum for his dedicated efforts in smoothly running this forum and organizing every session successfully. I'm thankful to the members of First Dialogue Forum and the whole team of SFSRM for their enormous cooperation in the organization of the webinar. Special thanks to all the foreign and Indian participants who took efforts to be with us this evening. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge your knowledge partners of First Dialogue Forum. Sonyara Private Limited, Curve Engineering and Marketing Private Limited, Lab Systems Private Limited. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for your time and look forward to see you uh, in such webinars. Ma'am, a small token of love from our side, a virtual uh, certificate uh, that I would like to present. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, being here and speaking to you all this, this morning. Yeah, just a second, ma'am. Just a second. Ma'am, a small token of law from our side, uh, a virtual certificate of appreciation. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. So with this, we come to the end of the seventh session of the first dialogue webinar series. It was indeed a word, wonderful session, ma'am. Thank you so much for being here with us and spending your valuable time with us. Mm -hmm. We hope to look forward for more such lectures from you in the coming future. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And I would love to be a part of it. So you know how to reach me. Yeah, sure, ma'am. <laughs>